So, as you can clearly see, this week we're trying out a new video format. I've literally just moved from that side to this side, but now well, we'll see what difference it makes. Uh, greetings, fellow scholar, and welcome back to another episode of Avon Explains. And now I apologize for not sending out a video last week, uh, but I have been caught up in something that many of you will probably be familiar with. Uh, it's called school. Uh, it's a bane of many students' existence, and to this week in particular has been heavy on the exams and assessments. And I know many of you are also having your exams and assessment, be it your IGCSEs, some major assessment for subjects, or even your final exams of the year. And for all of you out there who have yet to take your exams, count yourselves lucky, uh, but good luck when they do come around, and the best of luck to those who have taken their exams. But in keeping with that, theme of exams and education, today we're going to look at the history of education. Where exactly did schools come from and how are they different depending on what society needed when they were built. In this week of Avon Explains, we explore the history of education. So in this week's episode, we're going to take a look at three key case studies. The first of these is ancient Egypt, the second is dynastic China, and the third is 1800s Britain. Now all of these three case studies have been chosen because they represent a unique evolution in the way of education. So without further ado, let's get started on the first one, ancient Egypt. Now, around 3000 BC, when the Egyptians were in the Nile in their golden age, making pyramids that we have yet to fully explore and solve, visiting the land of Punt that we have yet to prove the existence of, uh, but they were also doing great things with their education. It's generally believed that the first schools came about as a result of Keti, the chief treasurer to Mentuhotep II, a pharaoh of the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. Uh, now, Keti realized that there would need to be some sort of institution where children were taught the skills and information that they needed in order to take the jobs and positions that the pharaoh required them to have in order for the country to continue to run. And this was how schools started out. You have to remember that this is how schools were meant to function. They were meant to give children the information and the knowledge that they needed to then take up a job in the future. Now, as a result, obviously, schools were built uh, but these schools were only accessible to a very, very small elite at the top of the Egyptian hierarchy. Only the very rich could afford to send their male children to these schools. You have to remember at this time, females were very much dominated in society. They didn't have any roles that we consider major today, and they weren't allowed to go to school as a result of that. So if you were able to go to these schools, you'd probably learn history, geography, science, medicine, and maybe even a bit of religion. Now, the best jobs that you could get from learning at these schools were advisors to the pharaoh, soldiers in the army, architects of the great pyramids, or even, and most coveted of all, doctors for the royal priests. Yes, remember in ancient Egypt, religion played a huge role in society and everyday life. So being one of the priests that could communicate with the gods and send them their will was quite something at the time. You had quite a few privileges and people looked up to you quite a bit if you were able to take that job. But of course, for the other 99 or 98% of Egyptians that couldn't afford to go to education, they simply did what we now call apprenticeships, where their fathers taught their sons the trades that they needed, and the mothers taught their daughters the skills that they needed. For fathers, they taught their sons whatever skills were required to continue the business, be it farming, metallurgy, tanning of leather and other um, skins, or anything else that their father had made a living out of. Now, for mothers, it was slightly different. Again, women at this time were very much under the men in society, and as a result, mothers were more likely to teach their girls about the ways in which to run a household, how to be a good wife to a future man, and 
even the current politics of the nation so you could discuss it with small talk over a cup of tea or whatever they had back then. Wine? Well, I have no idea. Anyway, uh, but regardless, this is something that we're going to see a lot of in history, right? The people who can't go to school learn whatever skills they need from their parents who have to pass it down to them generation by generation. And it's not a bad thing per se, but generally speaking, the nations that rely on this form of education are more likely to be much lower in terms of development than the nations that have a high number of people going into advanced fields, such as the sciences, the STEMs, mathematics, or any sort of high position job that the Egyptians at the time craved. Now, let's talk about literacy as well. In ancient Egypt, you probably have recognized the hieroglyphic system. This was a very complex writing system at the time using drawings instead of actual letters that we're used to today. Now obviously not everybody needed to learn how to read or write because hardly anybody would need to read or write in a daily basis. Only the people who were important and needed to be able to do this were taught the language of the Egyptians and these were obviously the scribes, the priests and the doctors who needed to re read and write the wishes of the pharaoh or any daily reports and stuff like that. But the key difference between ancient Egyptian um, schools and our modern day schools was the lack of any actual assessments. We don't have any written record of how the Egyptians tested their students and how well they'd learned. We just know that once the students completed their education, they could go apply for the job and if they got it, well, good for them. So that's where we bring into our second case study. The Education in ancient dynastic China. Now in dynastic China, you have to remember there were a lot of changes in the educational system. So let's start at the beginning. During the Han Dynasty, there were five key schools in the capital. Now these schools taught the six arts, calligraphy, rites, music, charioteering, archery, and uh, I forgot what the other one. One moment, let me just check my notes. Ah, and mathematics. All right, then. So those were the six arts that they taught Chinese students at the school. Now, again, these schools were very, very much locked to the very privileged and upper class of society. Middle and lower class workers, again, relied on teaching their children whatever trade they had been doing for their entire lives in order to continue making a living. But during the Han Dynasty, there was also a new sort of exam, the nine rank system. Now, during the previous Qin Dynasty, they realized that they needed to bureaucratize the empire. And what this meant was that the instead of having the emperor and his advisors control the entire country, they would hand over a limited amount of power and capability to tens of thousands of court officials and bureaucrats that would go around and station themselves in the different regions and provinces of China, reporting back to the emperor and the council uh, in the capital about any m weird going on or any reports of the progress of the region. And that was how it was run for much of its history. But with this need to bureaucratize the empire, the Chinese emperor realized that he needed a way to be able to recruit individuals that would serve him loyally, but were also extremely capable at doing this civil service job. So he created what we now know as the infamous Chinese civil service examination, one of the trademarks of Chinese education in history. Now, this uh, exam was based off the teachings of Confucius and Taoism, the two key philosophies that ruled ancient China. And this tested the participants' ability to solve daily problems that a court official might encounter using these philosophies. Now, throughout the different dynasties, there were obviously different interpretations of the exam, you know, different emperors based off rules on how long the exam was, who had to monitor the exam, how the exams went, and how the results were finalized, and that sort of thing. But the general concept remains the same. Use the exam as a way to measure the applicability, if you will, of future civil servants by testing their ability and their potential in doing well at their future job. And many assessments these days are sort of like that, right? But they're just for the certain disciplines. A math test uh, shows 
a teacher how much their students have learned in a mathematical course. A history essay shows the teacher how well the students are able to articulate arguments and so forth, right? It's related to the subject more than an actual profession that they're meant to have. But in ancient China, the profession was more important. So participants would often spend 24 to 72 hours, that's right, a whole day to even three days locked in a room no bigger than about three meters in width and length. And they had was a table, a bucket as their loo, and a piece of quill, whatever they used to write with, ink, and plenty of paper. Now, obviously, the civil service exam had to have different levels at which you could take it. Now, the first of these levels was the county level, or sort of the district level, if you will. If you pass this exam, you could choose to move on to the province level. Now, at the province level, it was much harder, obviously, as you go along in difficulty. And if you pass the province level, you would be able to attend the annual and uh, capital exam that was held within the capital city of the time. I believe at this point it was Peking, modern day Beijing. They may have changed it several times. You can look this up for yourself. But if you passed this third level, you would be invited to the Imperial Palace itself for the final exam level. This was known as the Jinshi, apologies for the pronunciation, and it was the most prestigious exam in all of China. People who passed this exam were immediately guaranteed a high spot within the cabinet of the emperor. And oftentimes it was the emperor himself who oversaw the exam, being the grand teacher or grand tutor of all China. Now, obviously, in later years, the emperor would often hire one of his servants to just monitor the exam for him. But to be fair, I don't think you'd like to be proctoring an exam for three whole days straight when you're ruling a country. You have much more important things to do than look at, you know, the next generation of courtiers and administers. But anyways, once these exams were finalized, the scores would be checked and people would be given back their reports and they'd be given a sort of like a perspective of how well they would have done otherwise. Now, obviously, if you chose to stop taking the exam and had simply achieved the level that you'd last taken, you would still be able to keep your degree and you'd be able to serve in many other positions, just not any positions that require you to take a higher level. So, for example, if you passed the county level exam, but didn't quite make it to the provincial level, you could still serve as a tutor for the next generation of civil service exam takers in the county. Or you could serve as a administrator for your village to the prefectural uh, manager. But obviously it was much more complicated than that. And I won't go into the specifics of it. I'll link some websites down below so you can check it out for yourself in greater detail. Now, the civil service exam has been uh, repealed. It was removed by the Qing dynasty in 1905 after cries for modernization once China had been attacked and humiliated by Western powers. Nowadays, Chinese students sit through what we call the Gaokao exam. Apologies again for the pronunciation. It's a nine hour exam, which in our standards is a lot. That's almost a whole waking day. But back in the days when Chinese students took three day exams for their civil service, I think we can say that we're having it better off now than we they did back then. But anyways, let's move on to 1800s Britain. The last case study we're going to do today, though certainly not the last case study that you should look into. I'll link down the case studies in my website below, and I hope you guys check that out as well. So moving on into Europe. Now, unlike Asia, where there was a heavy emphasis on government controlled exams and schooling in Europe, the government was slightly more lax on education. The government believed that it wasn't necessary to put so much money into educating its people of the belief that these people would not be able to do much with that education for a long time. And plus, it was pretty expensive to build schools back then. So what the government in Europe did is that they allowed private individuals and the church to manage the exams and schooling of the day. You may have heard of church schools or Sunday school uh, in Europe where children go to a church or even a monastery and they learn the ways of their religion and a few basic skills such as Latin or writing and reading. 
But it wasn't until the turn of the 19th century that the government of Britain started to get involved and at least concerned with education. Now, at this time, it is the Industrial Revolution. Britain is in the grasp of its golden age, but it comes at a cost for children. Many children in Britain will never step foot in a classroom for their entire lives. They will spend their days, some from as young as the age of six, working in damp, horrible and dangerous conditions in coal mines, factories, tanneries, breweries, you name it. Any place, any workplace in the UK, they could probably be found there. And these children were not given great pay. They could be malnourished and some could even die on the job. And it was just because they needed this capital to keep their family afloat and barely afloat by that I mean. So in 1833 and 1847, the government passed the Factory Act, which limited the employment of children for factory work for factory owners. Now, later on, the government would outright ban the employment of children under the age of 10 and later set strict conditions on how children workers were meant to be treated. But more importantly for us, in 1870, the government decided to take its own hand in education and pass the Elementary Education Act, which set up what we now know as the British education system and basically allowed the government to fund the creation of schools, the recruitment of teachers and the essentially setting up of educational systems for its citizens. Now, later on in 1888 and 1890 and 1891 and so on and so forth, further acts were put out and these acts did pretty much the same thing. Some of them secured more funding for schools. Others actually dictated what had to be taught in schools. And this is where we get really important here, because in Britain, the three R's were the most important thing in education. And this was arithmetic, reading and writing. Now, the British believed that the mark of a good student was not so much their knowledge, but their discipline, their behavior. They believed that a good graduate was a person who could work loyally and effortlessly without so much as a single complaint. So they obviously drilled their students much like an army drill sergeant would drill their soldiers, right? The schools were given strict timetables. The children were taught to be punctual. They had to be polite to everybody else. Good conduct was encouraged to both peers and teachers alike. And obviously, if they didn't follow these rules, then, well, there'd be a nice ruler or cane waiting for them when they got back to class. Um, some people still have traumatic memories of that today. But anyways, after these schools were set up, Britain became a much more sort of friendly environment for children, if we will. The schools were able to be funded by the government. And even though children were unable to afford the schools themselves, the government would pay for them because the government now mandated that education up until the age of 10, at least back then, was compulsory for both males and females. Now, this is where we get really important. We're seeing here finally the barrier of division between genders and education being broken down for the first time. And this marked the beginning of a sort of educational revolution, if you will, in Europe, where many other countries followed Britain's model of state funded schools taking over from the private religious schools. Uh, state-funded curriculums with new textbooks and materials and obviously different um, compulsory requirements for education as the years went by, depending on age and gender and economic background. So those, that's it for our case studies. We're going to again review how ancient Egyptians first set up school, how dynastic Chinese introduced exams, and how 1800s Britain introduced government control. All these three key aspects still play a role in our education today, though many of us probably take it for granted that we aren't as disciplined, I suppose, uh, or our teachers aren't as strict with us as they once were back then, or our exams were not as tedious and long as that 24-hour one that the previous Chinese students had to take back in their day. So for as long as humanity will continue to be on Earth, which might not be for very long, education will probably be one of the most important things in the world that we need to continue funding and improving. But for now, that's the history of education in a nutshell. Well, not really in a nutshell, but through three case studies. Thanks guys for watching, and I'm Avon of Avon Explains, signing out.